thank you very Mr. much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mangat sir. Uh, I hope you can see my screen and hear me speak. Yes. Uh, you are clear, Dr. Bapak. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, first of all, let me tell you that uh, OCT is just like uh, uh, the histopathology, and it's quick, non-invasive, and reproducible. And uh, uh, this is the evolution of OCT right from the time domain OCT to the spectral domain, to the swept source. This is the evolution of OCT which has occurred. And it works on the principle, the basic principle called interferometry, where uh, if there is a difference, uh, uh, then two waves of the same frequency having similar phases will add to each other. And in opposite phases will sub subtract. And uh, basically light from the source is directed to a reflecting mirror and uh, then the reflections are taken and the differences in the reflections and the interferometry is basically taken as the uh, uh, image. Now in the time domain OCT, we have somewhere around 10 microns of, uh, 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 we have about 10 microns of the resolution, which improves in a spectral domain to about five to seven microns. In the new OCTs, it can be going up till about three microns in resolution. These are some of the prototype models. One is a Heidelberg Spectralis and other one is a Cirrus. And there's first thing which uh, the scan acquisitions, you should know that there's something called a raster line in which you know fine lines are there on the surface of the retina, which gives a good resolution from top to bottom. Then you can have radial scans. These are more for screening and then a 3D scan uh, in which you can either a 6 into 6 or 7 into 7 in new machines, it can go up in 12 into 12 also. Uh, and then for scan acquisition, you should have a reasonable pupil uh, diameter of approximately three or more. Uh, appropriate scanning protocol is low, uh, selected and patient is instructed to look at the internal target. And then you get the OCT image. So now let's go to how to read an OCT scan. So these are the different, uh, right from the posterior cortical vitreous to the pre-retinal space to the retinal nerve fiber layer. You can see all the you know ganglion cell layer, inner plexiform, inner nuclear, outer nuclear, outer plexiform, all these layers are seen here. And as a postgraduate, we need to look into this particular image and look at this image for a long, long period of time and identify each of these layers before you go in for interpretation. Now, we should always look at the patient's name, age, gender, uh, probably the race. You can see here that, you know, this picture, you can see that there's some hemorrhages around here. You know, should no look at the uh, eye that we have scanned, the location where you have scanned, probably if the location is not in the center, if it's somewhere here and it may show an edema, doesn't mean that there is a central edema. So the location, the signal strength, the direction, all this we need to look at. Okay. And then we need to carefully look at what is happening to the pre-retinal space, the epiretinal space, what is happening here on the surface of the retina, the intraretinal and the subretinal. Intraretinal, we can divide into an outer retinal, which is outer and inner retinal, which is inner. So we should know what are the hyper-reflective and the hypo-reflective, apart from the usual hyper-reflective, uh, like, uh, like the internal limiting membrane, the RNFL, the ganglion cell uh, layer, the IPL and the uh, OPL, so these are the hard extrates, hemorrhages, drusen, epiretinal membrane, the choroidal neovascular lesions, and the disciform scars. All these are hyperreflective, and there are some hyporeflective apart from the normal hyporeflective, which are the outer nuclear, the the cell layers. Uh, then we can have intraretinal or subretinal fluid, which actually looks at as hyporeflective. So this is just a tabular chart of hyperreflective and hyporeflective normal structures and abnormal structures here. Okay, now let us go to qualitative analysis. So description has to be done by the location. Where is it? And form and structure. What is the anomaly in that structure? And reflective qualities, whether it is hypo or hyper reflective. Now, when you come to quantitative, whenever we are looking at serial uh, OCTs, we should always look at quantitative analysis. And then uh, we should have uh, different segmentation algorithms are there. Like this is a typical algorithm, molecular thickness. You can see 207 here and 213, and the outer four and the further outer four. This is a change analysis. You can see this is a pre uh, pre scan, and this is a scan now. So this is the quantitative data that we'll look at. Now let us look at each of the OCTs per se. Now uh, uh, this is uh, vitreo macular tract, uh, you know, adhesions, which could be focal adhesions or broad VMAs or focal VMA with uh, uh, with uh, elevation there. So vitreomacular traction, when you're looking at uh, vitreomacular traction, 
you are looking at focal traction here, like then focal vitreomacular traction with a pseudocyst inside the inner retina and a broad uh, traction. So this is how you differentiate that. And then an idiopathic epiretinal membrane, you are dividing into 1A, 1B, and 1C. 1A with outer retinal thickening and minimal inner retinal change, 1B with outer retinal invert projection and inner retinal thickening, and 1C with prominent thickening of the inner retinal layer. So that's how you classify the epiretinal membranes. And then you move on to type 2A and 2B. 2A with a pseudo hole here. You can see many a times you can see a pseudo hole here and uh, with the uh, uh, schisis as well, that is 2B. Now, these are some of the epiretinal membranes pre and post surgery and uh, vitreomacular tractions focal as well as uh, diffu uh, broad tractions pre and post surgery. Now, macular hole gas has uh, classified the macular holes and OCT classification has almost gone very, uh, very, very, very much like that only. So you can see this is a, a full thickness macular hole a full thickness macular hole without VMT, full thickness macular hole, uh, you know, large macular hole, a lamellar macular hole. So these are how it is. Now uh, you can see this is a macular hole here. This is the, you have to scan through this to get the hole. Surrounding this, you may actually get something like an edema. So that is why it is very important to know which, which of these lines you are having here. So otherwise you may mistake it as an edema. I have seen that also. So this is again another uh, macular hole here, and uh, there is a hole forming factor also, which we can take into consideration before we do the surgery. These are some of the pre and post macular hole surgeries. Now, uh, uh, you know, retinal thickness assessment in, in vascular diseases, you can have the patterns of the diabetic macular edema. This is important in deciding the treatment protocol or quantification, monitoring the response and prognostic indicators, etc. cetera. So, uh, Okay, so diabetic macular edema patterns are spongy, cystoid, serous detachment, uh, posterior hyaloid, etc. So now, so diabetic uh, posterior hyaloid, etc. So now, okay, so that's a diffuse spongy edema. This is cystoid uh, spaces within it, serous uh, submacular detachment. And uh, there could be a lot of times mixed uh, uh, things like that. In a branch retinal vein occlusion, generally you can see this is a central retinal vein occlusion. This is a branch retinal vein occlusion. You can see in a branch retinal vein occlusion, one side will be usually normal and the other side will be abnormal based on how you take the scan. Whereas in a central retinal vein occlusion, it will be another way around. So uh, you can see it should always correlate where you take the scans, etc. You can see the cystoid spaces here with uh, hyperreflectivity. So more hyperreflectivity means that there is more ischemia also. So these are again some retinal vein occlusions. Uh, central retinal artery occlusions will definitely have a huge hyperreflectivity of the inner retinal layers, and there will be shadowing beneath that. And now coming to into dry AMD, you will have some brucinoid deposits here with retinal pigment epithelial waviness. Whereas whenever there is an exudative retinal detachment, we will start seeing fluid, be it uh, subretinal, uh, intraretinal, or uh, or uh, you know pigment epithelial detachment. So these are different types. You can see this is uh, a type one, uh, uh, a type type two choroidal neovascular membrane with uh, uh, you know hyperreflective deposit here. And here you can see a type one where you can see the pigment epithelial detachment here and uh, large pigment epithelial detachment. Uh, so uh, you can have here, you can see the sub RP fluid, the sub uh, retinal fluid, and there is not so much of intraretinal fluid in this particular case. So this is a large uh, pigment epithelial detachment, which is basically a type one retinal, uh, type one CNVM. Now central serous chorioretinopathy uh, there will be just a fluid there and there will be probably increased choroidal thickness. Basically, we do an OCT so that we will know how it is uh, moving on. So these are some central serous retinopathy pictures. Now coming on to OCT angiography, it's again a non-invasive diagnostic method. Let us go a little forward to say that, you know, movement of the uh, blood circulation is what we process here and the rest of it is subtracted. And to generate the, uh, to generate the, uh, uh, image of the retinal microvascularization. Each scan is examined and temporal 
change in contrast in a specific location is attributed to movement of erythrocytes. Here you can see the superficial retina, the deep retina, or the avascular zone. And uh, we can take different slabs, the inner retinal slab, outer retinal slab, etc., and also the optic nerve head. Uh, let me go to some more. Yeah, this is an important thing for postgraduates to find out fluorescent angiography versus ICG versus OCT angiography. Here, it's a very, very fast acquisition. And completely, uh, it doesn't require any invasiveness, whereas fluorescent or ICG requires a longer duration, multiple image frames taken, and there can always be nausea, vomiting, and an F5 axis. A fast and non-invasive nature of OCT angiography means that uh, it can be conducted very frequently. Almost every month we can do. Dye leakage is something that you will see in fluorescent as well as ICG, which is never seen in OCT angiography. But the advantage of it is that the neovascularizations and the things that leak are much better seen there. So OCT angiography does not employ a dye and cannot evaluate uh, leakage. FFA versus ICGA versus OCTA, again, uh, dye leakage and staining do not occur in OCT angiography, so the boundaries can be quite well seen. And again, two-dimensional versus three-dimensional nature. So this can be used in AMD, CNVM, diabetic retinopathy, arterial and venous occlusive disease, CSCR, glaucoma, etc. Okay. So uh, coming to some examples, you see these on first images in which you can see these neovascularizations. And, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a fluorescent as well as uh, ICG, you have an early, mid and late phase. Whereas here we have the on face images of the superficial and the deep retina to actually look at the anatomical uh, uh, location. So these are, you know, you can color code it, mature vessels versus immature vessels. Uh, and you can segment it at different levels to get different on first images. This is uh, type 2 neovascular AMD with uh, uh, connection. And uh, here you can see uh, type 3 neovascularization. And sometimes fibrotic CNVM, you can see large areas of complete uh, uh, you know, uh, void, flow void, which means this much area is completely flow void. OK. A pigment epithelial detachment can look like a flow void, but you should always correlate it with the uh, the uh, OCT per se. The OCT angiography has to be, whether, wherever it is getting cut, has to be looked at through the OCT as well. Polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy also, uh, you can see the polyps. Actually, you can see the polyps here, multiple polyps, sometimes on uh, uh, this thing. Non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you can see the microaneurysms. These are microaneurysms, the fluorescent angiogram. These microaneurysms also are seen in the OCT angiography. And diabetic macular edema, you know, you can see the cystoid nature of the cysts, etc., and you can see the, you know, where the leakages are, where the microaneurysms are, you are able to see that. Irma can also be seen with a lot of ischemia and uh, new, new uh, you know, proliferation here. This is like the capillary perfusion in the central area. You can see the normal and you can see the breakage of the capillary uh, plexus as the uh, retina moves on from moderate and pre-DR to PDR. Central retinal artery occlusion, again, you can see the reduced arterial perfusion, which is evident. So BRVO, you can see that uh, segmental uh, drop of the flow. So these are uh, CRVO with cystoid macular edema. You can see the cystoid spaces. Here all we can see the different uh, layers. Uh, and wherever it is ischemic, you can see the hypoperfusion there. Now in central serous retinopathy, OCT at the level of the choriocapillaries demonstrate increased choroidal flow in that particular region and corresponds to the overlying SMD. Vista is a color analysis in which color of the pixel represents the erythrocyte flow at a given location. And uh, uh, red means relatively high flow and blue means relatively low flow. So there are a lot of new things which are coming in the OCT, OCT and geography and uh, non-invasive imaging, which will help us understand the diseases much better and also monitor the diseases quite well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so if there are any questions from uh, the audience, you may go ahead. Yes, uh, so would the chair uh, chairpersons would like you take uh, would you like to take any questions, sir? Uh, well, I think uh, since these two talks uh, are regarding the most important investigations, which are uh, uh, being performed by most of uh, the uh, which you read before, so, uh, so I think uh, uh, 
are there any questions here from anybody yeah, just uh, one because it will be a common question routinely i think i i can club this question for both previous speakers with the current scenario what is oct and octa being so frequently used and more and more uh, being preferred because of obvious advantages what are the indications obviously you still want to do fluorescent angiography though you have oct a available with you maybe uh, I, i just i can address this question to both the speakers anyone can take it this is a general question for anyone i guess sure yeah please. okay so uh, it's a very valid question and since the oct has come i think uh, uh, the number of angiographies are going down and uh, but still i would say that in uh, whenever you are doing any vascular uh, case wherever you are suspecting leakage i think it's imperative to do at least a baseline fa and post that you can probably do the follow ups on an octa and we don't need to do any further fluorescing angiograms unless until we suspect any particular pathology so i think that the numbers might go down because we would not need any uh, subsequent fas but yes uh, uh, octa is uh, changing our uh, uh, management in a very big way apal you have anything i completely agree baseline evaluation i think uh, even now gold standard would be uh, fluorescent angiogram but uh, sooner or later we will i think change significantly uh, because practice demands more more and more non invasiveness and slowly we may change more to uh, oct angiography like shoya said monitoring is really very very uh, easy with oct i think uh, uh, what has changed significantly at least uh, we have seen we hardly do now angiography for something like age related macular degeneration we may still do for diabetics because uh, i think in uh, probably there's hardly any indication maybe you do icga sometimes but not really uh, yeah. angiography in uh, amd case so i think there's a huge difference i don't know what oh, more than, uh, rajiv no, vascular no, macular uh, diseases can be picked up with oct angiography but the periphery right now we will require fluorescent 